my my fascination with the axolotl was regeneration um i watched a the amazing Spider-Man. I think the one with the uh, Andrew Garfield, <laughs> the reboot. Um, and uh, even though that the basis of that movie was a lizard, the axolotl had this abil- innate ability to regenerate not only limbs, but spinal cord, half the brain, um, vir- virtually all these uh, m- the muscles in- inside of it. And so naturally the question then becomes, how does this happen? Um, and so that was really the first part is maybe unlocking some of those uh, or just identifying some of those uh, programs so then potentially we could translate that over to humans. So that was step one. But then step two, um, I think from a bioinformatics perspective and a computational biology perspective, as a trainee, I really wanted to understand how their genome was built or what makes their genome unique? Because again, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that 32 gigabases, that's a lot of DNA. And how do you fit that into a cell of a seeming of, of a smaller uh, creature, right? I mean, the, if you compare the size of an axolotl to a human, and we have 10 times less the size of their DNA, how does that get packaged into such a strong and into into such a a small uh, body. (laughs) Um, And so that was another fascination as well. And so um, providing, you know, being able to uh, essentially um, study that, but then also provide some resources for the community to maybe take that uh, research a little bit further. That's what excited me um, about that field. And uh, it really made me um, I think it made me a lot more appreciative of the human um, <laughs> model because a lot of the bioinformatics resources, the genome, uh, like a lot of that wasn't built when I first started. And so, you know, you were kind of navigating through the Wild West. And um, I'd like to think, you know, maybe finding the same problems that uh, that people originally had with, you know, even developing the human genome or human methylome um, during that time. I think the, the weirdest thing about the axolotl like, isn't the fact that they regenerate, th- I mean, that is weird. Um, yeah. Like they regenerate all these things, but when it, when it's regenerated, it works. You know, it's not just like a hump, like it's not like a lump of flesh yeah. or, you know, something like it, com- it's like some of the, like the cell egg stuff going on, or even when they're trying to make a, like a heart tissue or something, they have to do some work before it can do what it, it was, you know, what it, the original cells were, but it, it'll grow an entire hand and it'll, it'll just start walking with it. It's like, that's weird. That's yeah. like, it just comes out. I mean, unless I, I, I'm misremembering, but it's just like, it just. It regrows the arm and the arm just starts working. Like they don't have to do like physical training or anything. <laughs> like there's just, that's such a weird thing given like, you know, all the stuff that we have to do just to maintain, uh, you know, if we break a leg, all the, you know, the work we have to do just to get that to kind of be realigned. And there's no, yeah. you know, it's no, an entirely I, different. Yeah. I think, I think that's absolutely true. And uh, one thing that really makes it a, a model system for regeneration is the fact that if you look at their limbs, I mean, they have four, uh, four fingers. So it does look like this. But the composition of those uh, of of that limb is very similar. Similar. They have the humerus. They have the um, uh, sorry the 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 four limb bone. Um, the, they got the digits. They have um, uh, they have uh, what is it? All the vas- the blood vascular system is very similar and akin to that of the human uh, the the human arm. And so it provides at least like some sort of translational um uh, um. So, so some sort of translation between between the two models and actually to your point like uh when we start there the other model that is typically uh studied in regeneration is the lizard tail but the problem with the lizard tail is that it comes back different than when you than the original um uh tail that was cut off it's actually a lot more cartil- cartilaginous uh, than actually with the spinal cord and everything and and you can actually see with a lot of the um there was a there was a paper that came out um, a while back where they showed that uh, the the cell makeup is completely different than when it came before or that when it was before, which is not the case uh, with the axolotl limb. It's exact. Oh, it's almost exact. That's weird. And then, um, I, like you were mentioning with the bigger um, genome, like is it all useful in a sense? Like, is it like is it all? <laughs> adding up to a, a, the conclusion of like a working organism or is there, do you think there's stuff in there that's like, just kind of like carried over like, like luggage from the past? Uh, uh, I would actually, um, 
Um, so I will preface this by saying we're since the genome came out, I think back in 2019, and then the chromosomal assembly was 2021. We're still trying to unpack that, but a, um, a lot of it is repetitive, uh, uh, quote unquote, junk DNA. But what's interesting is if you look at some of these regenerative uh, organisms, such as uh, Planaria, the the flatworm, they also are, I think, greater than 50 percent. Um, uh, re repetitive genome. And so this is where we wonder, yeah, like it might be quote unquote junk or repetitive DNA, but what if, <laughs> I mean, time will tell, maybe, maybe it does serve a purpose in the biological function. So um, I don't know. It's, and I think that's, what's exciting is that now with a lot of the sequencing and the genomic uh, world <laughs> coming to play, um, that's where uh I think that's where really this next-gen sequencing and all that has been helping uh, us understand these biological processes a little bit more. Does the genome, is the genome stagnant your entire life or does it, is it like, does it decrease by any measure? It's like when you're born, you have a, a genome and then when you die 80 years later or whatever, is it the same more or less, or does it decrease at all? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, not sure. <laughs> I guess that's something, <laughs> that's something to, uh, to read about. Yeah, I was I was I, well, I was thinking I was like, what if like the extra like junk DNA is like extra copier ink, so so you can make more, you know, without it degrading like the telomeres and all this other stuff. So you have like more of a backlog to uh, use right. from if there's some like degradation or like so you have more fidelity. Yeah, I think in that respect it does uh, decrease. I mean, yeah, like as as you kind of already kind of hit um, those uh, poly A tails at the end of uh, well, I mean, I guess that's more RNA. So RNA does degrade in that sense. Um, in the case of the duplication, actually, uh, a lot of it was a genomic duplication that occurred for, for axolotls. Um, uh, that occurred, I think, uh, uh, like, it's a, a long time back in, in the entire scope of their, uh, in, in terms of their family um, separating from, uh, from the frog. Um, and so that's kind of... Uh, that could be a reason why their uh, do, uh, their uh, g genome is just completely is is so large is through that mm -hmm. duplication. Yeah, but but to answer your question, yeah, very very good question. 